I want to uh, welcome you to uh, this year's Titans of Real Estate panel. Uh, distinguished panelists, global attendees who are only here because you couldn't get into the Magic Johnson session. My name is Lou Feldman, and I'm the Los Angeles chair of Goodwin Proctor. And uh, I'm living proof, ladies and gentlemen, that there are no background checks for moderators. This is my 13th year uh, moderating this panel, which we started way back when. And uh, to mark uh, my 13th year, uh, directly after this uh, seminar, we're going to be having the Lou Feldman Bar Mitzvah. And uh, Mike Milken will present me with a beautiful certificate and a fountain pen, because today I am a man. <laughs> and speaking of men, we have an amazing lineup of white ones right here. <laughs> now, it's not their fault. Uh, at all. Uh, we tried to get Reese Witherspoon here, uh, but she was booked elsewhere. Uh, uh, yeah, uh. Anyway, uh, let, me, uh, let me quote one of my, uh, we're in Hollywood, so I want to quote one of my uh, favorite directors, Sidney Pollack. May he rest in peace. And Sidney once remarked, stars are like thoroughbreds. And obviously, we have stars here. Yes, it's a little more dangerous with them, which if you've been here before, you know. And uh, yes, they are more temperamental. And yes, you have to be careful because you could be thrown. So according to Sidney Pollack, our panelists are dangerous, temperamental, and require extreme caution when attempting to mount. From the retail industry, we have real estate titan, philanthropist, and veteran milk and global speaker, Peter Lowy. He's the CEO of our client, Westfield. Peter's company owns one of the largest shopping center portfolios uh, in the world, with 105 centers in Australia, New Zealand, the United States, the UK, and Brazil. And last year, over 1.1 billion customers visited a Westfield mall, generating over $40 billion in retail sales. And for the ladies, there's a special treat for you. If you close your eyes, not only will you receive pearls of wisdom from Peter, but from his Aussie voice, you'll fantasize that you're on a date with Hugh Jackman. <laughs> and that ain't too les miserables. <laughs> yeah, that's but, the worst one in I 13 know. years. I'm sorry, you know? <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And also returning with us this, uh, uh, this year is my friend, uh, international real estate investor, Bill McMorrow. Bill's the chairman and CEO of uh, Kennedy Wilson, which he took public in 2009. Bill purchased Kennedy in 1988 as a real estate auction company and has built it into a $13 billion international powerhouse. Since 2010, KW's raised $8 billion of equity and acquired more than $8 billion of uh, real estate investments. They have 24 offices in the UK, the US, Ireland, Spain, and Japan. With all that travel, Bill's passport has more stamps on it than the lower back of the Kardashian sisters. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Bill. Where is he getting new to our uh, Milk and Global real estate panel and sporting that new panelist smell, <laughs> Nicholas Skorsch. Nick is chairman and CEO of American Realty Capital, an alternative investment advisory firm Nick is no stranger to real estate. He's executed over 3,000 transactions, $15 billion in transactional value. And among his successes, he and famed MBS creator Louis Ranieri founded American Financial Realty Trust, a publicly traded REIT, which was sold for $1.1 billion in 2007 to uh, what is now uh, REIT, uh, New York Stock Exchange traded REIT, Gramercy Property Trust. Nick received the Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneur of the Year Award by uh, Ernst & Young in 2003, a Lifetime Achievement Award from Ernst & Young in 2011, and this year Ernst & Young is naming a tax loophole for him. <laughs> Congratulations, Nick, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Our friend and Milken Institute veteran, Barry Sternlich. Barry also uh, is a true Renaissance man. Uh, he is a designer a painter, a philanthropist, a father, husband, insightful thought leader, and as everyone knows, a pro just a prolific deal maker. 
He serves as chairman and CEO of Starwood Capital Group, a private investment firm he formed in 1991, which focuses on global real estate, energy, securities, and infrastructure. He's also chairman of Starwood Property Trust, which is, as many know, the largest mortgage REIT uh, on Wall Street. And among his many contributions to the American real estate uh, landscape, Barry brought the boutique luxury hotel to grand scale with product like the W. He brought us the Starwood Weston Heavenly Bed, the Heavenly Bath, and was just contacted by King, Kim Jong-un to design the Heavenly Warhead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Barry. And only last, because his name ends in the 26th letter of the alphabet, is my friend, and many would say the real estate icon, Sam Zell. <laughs> Sam is chairman of Equity Group Investments and is one of the most widely known, respected, and some might say feared investors in the business. He's embraced for his general, uh, generous philanthropy to entrepreneurial and academic programs at Michigan, Wharton, Northwestern. He's an author. He's also the subject of books and articles. And his capacity to analyze and accept risk is something which fascinates me and obviously many other people. But dominating the real estate markets is only 30% of what he does. He has other companies and 70% of his time is spent on businesses like media, sports, recycling, energy, transportation, and finance. He races motorcycles, flies planes, in fact, spends more time than any other private citizen in the United, in the United States on a plane, about 1,500 hours a year, and enjoys uh, the quintessential American pastimes of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> He's my kind of guy. Thanks for being with us, Sam. So let's begin. Slide one, please. Mi amigas and amigos. Real estate is muy caliente once again. In general, uh, in general terms, the returns on real estate have crushed other investments like a Pamplona, uh, Pamploma steer's hoof on a spectator's sternum during the running of the bulls. Slide two. Real estate investment trust returns now exceed peak 2007 levels. Slide three, please. The growth in new capital targeting direct real estate globally continued to grow in 2012, despite continued uncertainties about the global economy. New capital uh, available for investment in 2013 totals about $320 billion US, which is a 3% increase from six months ago. And growth in available capital was recorded in all regions, uh, with the exception of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, or the EMEA. You'll see that on some slides. Slide five, please. The balance of market share between the Americas, Asia, and the EMEA region is now similar to 2,000 levels. Slide four. The amount of equity has grown, helping to offset the impact of basically lower leverage requirements that came in. Slide six. The United States has a lot of capital again. We haven't talked about the credit crunch or the capital crunch for a bit, and you can see why. Slide seven. Private and institutional investors are increasing their real estate capital deployment over other investors. So the cash which has been on the sidelines seems to now be coming out. Slide eight. Global collateralized mortgage obligations are on the rise, which will provide additional leverage for real estate and allow further lending. And then let's go to slide 30. Inflation's tame, even as central banks bloat their balance sheets. Take a look at slide 29. That's how the balance sheets have grown. That's how much money is being created. And those balance sheets look like Chris Christie's Dewadnam after his big gulp celebration following New York Judge Tingling's overturning of Mayor Bloomberg's ginormous soda ban. So with that background, uh, let's talk about the international markets, our first segment, where people are investing around the world. 
Slide 24, please. <laughs> Europe's in recession, no surprise. Slide 35, please. European unemployment is huge and on its way up. Slide 11, office rents are falling all over the world. So I'm going to start with Bill McMorrow. Bill, you've been, uh, you were last year, uh, I think, the subject of a lot of discussion up here in terms of going to uh, Europe and going to Ireland. How's it going in Ireland and the UK right now? Yeah, it has uh, turned out to be a great move for us. And it, as you pointed out, Lou, our focus has really been the United Kingdom and Ireland. And uh, the big thing that's changed in the, the last year that uh, I was here is the amount of liquidity that's returned to the market on the debt side. And you know that has really changed uh, uh, tremendously since last summer. And uh, all the American financial institutions, all the big banks are lending again in the two markets that we're in. About uh, a third of the uh, little over $8.5 billion of acquisitions that we've done has been in those two markets. And uh, we've been buying both debt and hard assets. We've been buying apartment buildings in Ireland. Uh, and uh, we just purchased the uh, State Street Bank building in Dublin. And unlike uh, you know, what you see in the slides here, particularly in the uh, higher quality areas in Dublin, rents are actually increasing, and vacancies are now down to, uh, uh, occupancies are close to 95%. And, and Ireland particularly is being uh, impacted by the California tech companies. And you've got over uh, 500 US companies that have their European headquarters in Ireland. And so all of the big tech companies, Facebook, and particularly Google, uh, Google now occupies almost uh, 600,000 square feet in Dublin. So the markets have changed a lot, and uh, there's more competition uh, with the equity capital uh, primarily coming from here in the United States. Uh Ireland would be unusual for me to think of as a tech area, but what is it that's drawing the tech companies there? Well, you have a very uh, high quality education system. You, in, in Ireland, you can go to school, you know, kindergarten to uh, end of college for free. Uh, you uh, have a young population, uh, half of the uh, population is under 35. And you, you have a uh, very favorable tax structure in Ireland where the corporate tax rates are 12.5%. Uh, and uh, so you, you kind of combine that all together. And you, it's been the only country in the EU that has actually had positive population growth in the last 10 years. And it's, it's, it's a small country. Uh, there's only 5 million people in Ireland. And so that's really what is causing uh, kind of the, the uh, the better outlook for Ireland. And Ireland is also, from a global perspective, has been able to deal with its debt problems. Uh, they've now extended out all their debt with the EU uh, to seven years. They're back in the bond market. When we first went to Ireland in uh, 2010, the Irish public debt was selling at a yield of almost 15%. And they just did a financing in the public market there at less than 4%. You obviously carry one ginormous shillelagh. Boy, <laughs> look at you. Um, Peter, last year you told us to focus on mature urban centers and uh, in the US, the UK, Brazil, where there were high barriers to entry and that you were actually moving into high quality uh, in, in all of your portfolio. Um, talk about London. Talk about how things are going in London. Uh, talk about Brazil as well, if you sure. will. Well, in London, uh, very similar. Um, when you look at the UK economy, we actually see two economies, one in London and one in the rest of the UK. Uh, and London itself is on fire. Um, I don't know about the office building business, um, but in our business, we, we did something uh, uh, five or six years ago that people would have thought is, is uh, nuts, actually. If I would have come to the conference five or six years ago, I would have told you we're going to put 3.4 million square feet of retail in the centre of London. 
Um, and we put one and a half million square feet in Shepherd's Bush, which is uh, three miles from Marble Arch. And then we built 1.9 million square feet in Stratford, right next to the uh, uh, Olympic uh, site there. Um, those two assets today do almost two billion pounds of sales. Uh, the one in, uh, in Shepherd's Bush now does about 980 million pounds. And its first year in Stratford, we did about 950 million pounds. Wow. Um, the key to what we're doing now is that while we, while we find uh, very urban areas that do have retail, is we're trying to find a, an area where the customer is not served. And you may think that going to the centre of London is a bit crazy where the customer isn't served because there is lots and lots of shopping. You've got Oxford Street, Bond Street, Regent Street, uh, um, then you've got uh, Harrods and you've got uh, Knightsbridge, Chelsea, etc. But the problem is the customer wasn't served. It was hard to get to, hard to get into, hard to get out of, and we just don't think the retail offering was strong enough. Um, so we were able to find that niche market. Uh, we're about to do the same in Milan. Uh, you might not go to Italy today to make major investments, although starting towards the end of next year, uh, we'll be building a billion and a quarter euro mall in Milan, about eight or nine kilometers outside of the center of the city there. Um, we did the same in Sydney, and what we're finding is that if you can invest in these major um, assets that have major market penetration, you get very, very good returns. Sam, uh, I mentioned Brazil when I was introducing Peter. Um, I you... thought I'd leave it to Sam. He knows. Uh, he's, he's the guy. He always um, knows. But Sam, you know, over the years, uh, and I just want to point this out to the audience, um, Sam told us to invest in Brazil because of the emerging middle class and to invest in manufactured housing in Mexico, to invest in Manhattan when everybody was running from Manhattan and to put capital to work in the safer regions of the Middle East. Um, all of those have worked out pretty damn well. The only thing that didn't work out was your newspaper stuff, but uh, you know, like you said, you pick your Headline is a headline. You know? Headline is a headline. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about South America now, Brazil, um, and your views? Yeah. Um, we, uh, we started uh, in, in Mexico in the late 90s, uh, primarily because we saw Mexico moving toward investment grade. And if there's any time in the history of a country that it's going to behave, it's going to behave when investment grade is just over the horizon. And we invested in retail and housing and finance and in Mexico, and then we went on and did the same thing in Brazil. Um, again, riding the curve of, of Brazil up to investment grade. And by the way, both countries, as soon as they got to investment grade, started to screw it up. But that, that's to be expected. Um, but we, we find Brazil even a slower growing Brazil to continue to be a very attractive environment for real estate. Uh, there is no question, I mean, when we first went into Brazil, I think 10 years ago, we had literally almost no competition. Uh, today, there is a lot of competition, but a lot less uh, enthusiasm uh, than was the case before. Um, and I think that, uh, the underlying fundamentals of Brazil continue to be extraordinarily attractive. I mean, one of the issues, and it came up in some of the other comments about, for example, uh, we spent quite a bit of time looking at Ireland, but in the end, five million people has no scale. 180 million people has scale. Uh, Self-sufficiency in water and energy and food uh, are pretty extraordinary assets for that country going forward. So we continue to be uh, very positive on Brazil, although we think it's going to be a much slower ride than what's been the case over the last 10 years. In other places in Latin America, uh, we've been spending a lot of time and invested a lot of capital in Colombia. Uh, Colombia, we think, may be the best country in Latin America today. Uh, it's got a free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, it's working on merging its stock markets with Peru, Chile, and Colombia, which I think will, when it gets done, be a funnel of capital. Uh, they have a lot of resources uh, and, uh, and a growing uh, population that's 
dramatically benefiting from the end of FARC. I mean, one statistic on Colombia just takes your breath away. In the last five years, Colombia has gone from producing 100,000 barrels of oil a day to 900,000 barrels of oil a day. And that's all about taking the FARC out of the area where the oil is being uh, developed and the failure of Chavez, which basically sent the entire PDVSA team, and they all now work for Colombia. So we, we think Latin America continues to be uh, a very attractive arena. Uh, we've survived Chavez, which I think his passing is really terrific for Latin America uh, and is going to be beneficial, I think, for Venezuela, because I don't think the current administration is likely uh, to be dominant going forward. So it's still in our hemisphere. Uh, I think the connections between America and Latin America continue to be strong and stronger, maybe not at, at the top political level, but you know, where's George Perez? George? How many Latins are there in Miami? How many Venezuelans? How many Brazilians? I mean, you, you can't speak English there anymore. There's nobody to listen. <laughs> so um, I think the connections are getting even tighter. And I have a very, and I think that the $64 question worldwide is demand. And I think Latin America has more demand than a lot of other places in the world. Thank you. Barry, um, uh, slide 22, please. Over the past four years, uh, you advised us to invest in retail and hotel properties in business centers in the US, the Middle East, India. Um, this is, uh, as you've come up and I've listened to you, uh, where, where are you attracted today? Um, what markets and which countries? Where are you investing? Um, uh, Outside the United so States. So our last funds were, private funds were like three billion and we invested probably 87% in the US, about 6% in Brazil and about 6% in, in Europe. This new fund we just closed is 4.2 billion and it's half invested, and in the moment it's about 80% invested in the US. Europe is picking up. Um, there's liquidity in Europe, there's debt markets in Europe. Um, the debt is coming in unbelievably fast. Uh, and the world hates or is searching for yield, and one of the last remaining places on Earth where the banking system is bust is Europe. So um, what was a huge hole, which was refinancing and getting debt for Europe, is becoming a now or a pond every day as capital pours into that market, which is from the equity side, it's a little tricky to underwrite. Talk about lack of demand. I mean, it's almost the poster child for a bad, a bad way. And, and, and I think when people forget about Europe, and I, I, I just wrote a letter to our LPs and I, my year end letter, and I said, I think the greatest risk in the world today is the social unrest that could, you could see in Europe because 30% unemployment rates of youth is not stable. And if you actually look at the economies in there, how they're doing, they're doing is worse than they did in the Great Depression. I mean, it is not good. And uh, we'll see what the ECB does on Thursday with rates, but they are so far behind the end game, and the only guy winning is Germany, and that doesn't feel like it's a good idea. Um, Brazil, we have an office in Brazil. We shuttered our office in, in um, India. And you know, we kind of, we file our clients and our and our, their interest in where they want to invest, and maybe I should use that in the inverse. Wherever they want to invest, I should, I should close the offices. Because um, you know, India was, we did two transactions back in 08, and we never, we had an office there for another six years, we never did another deal. And um, I don't think you can, you can see all the pieces of good on, on a piece of paper, 300 million people, less than the age of, I don't know, 18 or something like that. They're gonna find jobs, but the corruption and the pace, if you're an investor like we are, trying to ret earn a return, we can't play the 50-year cycle. We have to play the five-year cycle, or the three-year cycle, or the 10-year cycle. And um, India's probably gonna be okay, but the time horizon might be longer than our investors and I have patience for. Mm -hmm. the, the, the things that happen to you in India are indescribable. They're not, we always do the good things and the, the, the positives and the negatives of our investments. In India, you can't imagine what happens to you. I won't go into it, but it's staggering. And Brazil's been really disappointing, I'd say. I mean, the economy did not pick, off, pick up when they lowered interest rates. And uh, you already had a left government, so I didn't think you could get further left. Um, but there seems to be a, 
sort of a blockage in the, in the economy. And it's not, it's slowing down everywhere. Vacancy rates in Sao Paulo, I would tell you that slide that showed rents rising in Sao Paulo office, they'll be negative next year. They're going down, not up. The vacancy rates have been doubled. Absorption is very small. They built twice as much space as they absorbed. Rio's a different story, because uh, Rio is so difficult to, to build in. But uh, we have a very large logistics joint venture down there. We've built about 5 million square feet of, of distribution space. And I could even see it there. You know, you're building to 17, and your turns on cost unlevered. But, but the slowdown in leasing, you can see the economy breaking. And Mexico's taken its place as the hot kid on the block, and uh, partly because also there's some really interesting capital markets things that are happening in Mexico as they open up in the hotel space, these FIBRA executions, which are taking public hotels and getting access to capital, and lowering rates. And the, you know, what's in most interesting to me today is the money is just sloshing around the globe. It's, it's, it's chasing yield everywhere. It's going everywhere. It can change on a dime. And uh, the, there are vast, the, it's different today because there's very big pools of capital concentrated in these sovereign wealth funds and some of us that, that have capital to invest in these big pools. And we are agnostic, really. But I, I got to tell you, and now I've been doing this 25 years, 26 years since I graduated school, there is no place like home. You know, the, the Americas, if you're sitting anywhere else in the world, if you're sitting in Asia and you're looking at this lunatic whose hero is Dennis Rodman, right? It's like, uh, I don't want to be here. And Japan is like doing this great experiment that you saw they have the highest debt to GDP in the world. We're going to talk about it's them. It's semi-insane, right? Yeah. And then you come, you look at Latin America, while Brazil is interesting and Colombia is interesting, you, have, you still have this crazy woman in Argentina. You have the new regime in, in Venezuela. So it doesn't look so stable, and the economies are not roaring down there either. You go to Europe, and they're a basket case of social issues with governments that, you know, France, I, there are certain things I'm going to learn in my career. I, we bought a $3 billion company in France, and I've told our team, we have an office in London, we're very busy, but it's UK and Ireland, and uh, we're not doing anything else in France. I mean, that is a place is nuts. And, uh, <laughs> just like the French, you've surrendered. Nuts, just go visit, be a tourist, eat cheese, and drink wine, and enjoy yourself. Do not invest. Hey, you're stealing my line, guy. Yeah. Damn it. I mean, Fine. really. <laughs> Sorry. But, 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 so but so it all comes back to the US. I mean, uh, we're, we're but, relatively, and you can't hedge these currencies, don't forget. But yeah. the rupee and the real and the Russian currency, I mean, there may be good opportunities, but you're going to lose against the dollar. But a lot of thing, money. On one, one thing yeah. I always find interesting about these panels is as much as you live in America, everybody always wants to say, I go to Australia. look overseas, look overseas, except the best place to invest is here. Right. We're gonna and we always that. look outside of From here. From an Australian, that's a double dip credit. That's good. Yeah, that's <laughs> well, we've got a lot of money here. You know? It is good. Nick. I'm like the hedge fund guys. I always talk my own book. You, you know, should do six to 700 basis points. If you're doing 22 offshore, do a 15 here. Far fewer things. The standard deviation of your returns is going to be a lot lower in the US than it is in these emerging markets, which are just tricky. The currency, the debt markets, they are just hard. Tax structure changes, everything can change. Right. The, the, the one thing people never really look at is a risk-adjusted return. Right. And when you look at a risk-adjusted return, the returns out on parts of South America and parts of Europe uh, and Asia just don't give you the returns for the risk. Yeah. And the best risk-adjusted return is here. Nick. Uh, you play in the debt markets, you play in the private REIT market, you're raising billions of dollars in capital. Um, talk to me about what you're seeing in Europe. Well, I, actually, I, I um, mirror Barry's sentiments exactly. Um, our investors are a little different. We're not, and I, I respect the fact that most of the panelists are looking for where the opportunity lies. We're looking for the risk-adjusted return. Our investor base is almost uniquely retail, so we're raising give or take three to four billion dollars a quarter of capital that has to get put to work for uh, for basic uh, uh, yield. And we're not looking for um, uh, 25 IRRs. We're not looking for, uh, we're looking for a risk adjusted yield. So the US has been very strong. We are playing in the global markets to the, on the side of uh, kind of England, um, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands, we're not doing France. Uh, again, we can't quite figure that market out, and we haven't been able to successfully navigate it. But, but Barry's right, the debt is coming in fast uh, in, the, in the UK right now. You can hedge the currency. Uh, but when you look at home, and I think you had a slide, or I, don't, I think it was either, I think it's slide five. Um, but if you look at the, the uh, where the, if you look at where the volume's going, 
and I think the other one is maybe seven, if you could put that one up. Um, you could see that there's a lot of money flowing in. We're getting a ton of money coming in. So where are we going to put it? In our, fa in our business, we're looking at the U.S. as a primary core market. We like certain spaces here, like healthcare, uh, because the population's aging and money is moving in that space. Uh, we like the, the net lease spe sector, both office, uh, retail, and industrial. Retail particularly is flat because there's not enough debt. Uh, the b brokers are liking to tell everybody that retail is going crazy. Retail, retail sales? Retail, no, retail uh, net lease type of assets. Oh. Uh, if you look at the net lease sector, you break it into three buckets, and the retail space is growing less than the office space. Cap rates are not compressing as much. So when you look at the spreads on debt, you're borrowing money today, five, seven, ten-year money, kind of in the, the threes, high twos, and even sometimes low twos. High twos, not fixed, floating. No, high twos fixed. For what percent LTV? It, it, 50, 50, 10 years 50. in the high threes. Can you, can you introduce me to your lender, please? Yeah, I'm in too. There's a fee in this for you. All day. <laughs> I'll take a fee anytime. Fire. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're seeing, I mean, we just did a $500 million placement, to give you an example, at 245 fixed. For how long? Five. Par. Where do I sign? Five weeks? I'm going to have a room in the back. What you guys. Your collateral? Exactly. This is uh, good. Net lease assets that have duration of, of better than a decade with. Uh, with um, no, no. Um, is it a bank deal or a public no, no. market deal? All, all public market deal. We, we need to go talk. <laughs> I really, I'm getting. So when you talk. look at spreads, Peter, we're like, you're talking yeah, about getting, a five million dollar deal. I've got to have a conversation see, with my bank when I leave. Deal. We can talk about a deal, but the cool thing is when you got to really look at the spread. The spread is 45, 50, 55 percent leverage, low leverage, uh, all day long. You can generate a 500 basis point spread, U.S. So when in the history of the U.S. have we ever seen? Zero Fed funds and spreads, even if it's 350 or 400, it's still an aberration. And right now, that aberration exists here in this country. What now, also that Lou, what does that aberration say? In other words, I, I, you know, if you listen to what you're saying, you're saying it's not real. Yeah. And I'm agreeing with you. But the opportunity is uh, right now, for the well, next but, year, but, year and a half. You know, uh, we ain't winners or losers based on what we do in the next 10 minutes. Uh, but if we are sitting here and we're allocators of capital and we're risk takers, uh, how do we look at this inflation in available capital uh, that, you know, in effect has no, uh, no discipline to it? I mean, I just spent two days in Mexico. Uh, first thing that happened to me in Mexico is somebody said, hey, I'm selling dollars and buying pesos. Why? I said, what? He said, I'm selling dollars to buy pesos. Why? He says, because Mexico is not printing. I said, ooh. I said, well, you know, I don't have any time in my life where anybody wanted to buy pesos over dollars. But they're also, you know, <laughs> quote unquote, you know, uh, expanding their real estate finally. I met with President Zadio in 1996 to advocate REITs, and it only took until 2011 for the Mexican government to halfway get it done. That's longer than your time was. But once again, there's so much money floating around that it's like, the early days of our REIT world where there's no distinction based on quality. And I, well, no, I don't think that's the case, though. I think that the lenders aren't lending uh, at, at very competitive rates. They're 4 4.5% if you're, if you're borrowing on, on, on franchise credits or short duration credits or not lending at all. They won't lend. The same lenders won't be the same guy who will give you the 75% loan. They won't give you a, a, a loan on a three-year lease. They don't want the rollover. They're going to underwrite the hell out of that loan because they're still using their, their kind of post Lehman okay. underwriting standard. Well, Would you want to own a 10-year, 2.5% piece of debt? Nope. Even if it was the government? <laughs> Particularly if it was Particularly the government. Particularly if it was the government. But it, 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 lost. it, it oh. is a... Uh, <laughs> you, are, you are seeing a very funny... He's talking about the, the subsidized interest rate curve in the United States. He's talking about the greatest spread between cap rates no, no, and debt rates we've ever seen. In our careers, and uh, it is it that's is a right. fascinating issue because you're, the lack of discipline that's entering the debt markets 
is truly astonishing, oh. and the pace at which it's returning is astonishing. Yeah. And it is a hundred. Doesn't it sound like the two hundred six housing it is market. But let me ask you. Let, let, let me ask you a question. Are you starting to see asset price inflation? No. No. That's, that's what I was saying. I, I'm not seeing it yet. I'm seeing it in some markets and some asset classes, but I haven't. But seen even if it you yet. roll back, I mean, if you look at the the trend in the U.S. There's not, that, there's not as much debt as you need. You need most of the CMBS market right now to handle the debt that's rolling over on, in the normal course. The, there's so the, much money in the debt market, it's staggering. There is, but you have to deal with it. But also the rolling. amount of equity is also staggering. I mean, you talk about the sovereign wealth It's nothing wealth like funds. it was in 06 yet, but it still yeah. feels staggering. No, but there's a 100, 100, there'll be $100 billion this year. Oh, billion? it'll be 200. They don't underwrite anything anymore in the CMBS market. The same guys who drove the bus off the cliff are driving the bus off the cliff. They're all the rating agencies. They originate and sell. While Congress is talking about how much the lenders have to hold back and retain of what they issue, they're doing nothing, and the banks are issuing as fast as they can and selling it faster. And they're doing single CMBS securitizations again. Single you, asset, you, yeah. $800 million any, dollar CMBS. With any, it's interesting. We, we have an equity fund, and that takes a year and a half to raise, something like that. And the debt fund, like if you want to raise money in the debt markets, the tickets go from 20 million and 50 million to 500 million because everyone has money in governments, every institution in the world, earning zero. And nobody wants to have sovereign credit. They, they'll do anything other than sovereign credit. Let, let, me, ju let me just move to Japan for a moment because we're going <laughs> to look fun at, in the US. We're going to look at very, very We're trying very to keep low. your panel lively here. Yeah, no, you are, I you know. But uh, <laughs> it's going to be very lively as Bill talks to us about a deal that he just did and the interest rates that he's getting on his paper. So talk Zero. to us a little bit about Japan and the apartment market there where you have 50, uh, about 50 properties. I'm disappointed in Sam. I lost money this morning. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> it, it, yeah, we had, uh, we had an over-under on you, Sam, when, when the word, the F word would come out. Yeah. So it, uh, he lost. Yeah, I um, lost. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as Dr. Seuss said, I am what I am yes. what I am. <laughs> I had five and I'm minutes. Sam. Five minutes. <laughs> Sam, I am. Uh, took half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> took half an took hour. Half an hour. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's, well, let's look I, at slide. I, I agree with what everybody is saying here. The uh, the U.S. is really the play. You can talk all you want about international investing, but and obviously Sam would agree with me on this. I mean, we, you know, have just come to love the risk-adjusted returns you can get in the multifamily market here in the U.S., and we're predominantly here on the West Coast. And uh, we've just, uh, you know, ventured into Salt Lake City where we bought a couple big apartment projects there. And you're still, you know, we bought one at over a 7% uh, cap rate. So... What vintage was that? Eh, sorry? How old is the building? It's an older property. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, as far as Japan, it's obviously has changed tremendously in the last 45 days in terms of the debt market and what they're trying to do when, uh, with the yen going from, you know, 75 up to almost 100 now. Uh, but we just did a seven-year financing on our apartment portfolio in Japan uh, at uh, 130 fixed uh, for seven years. What kind, so, of, what kind of LTV? Sorry? What, what's the LTV loan to value? It's about a 50% cost. And, and cost. what do they value the apartments at in Japan? What cap rate? Is it a four? Well, the, the, the public market has gone way ahead of, you know, where the cap rates are now. Usually there's a lag. What, can, what do you buy apartments for in Japan? I actually don't know. Today, they're probably around five. Five. Yeah. And you can finance at one, three. Yeah. Fixed. And, and the, the big change in Japan here in the last uh, the rents go nowhere. three months has been uh, the willingness of the lenders to give you term. You know, it, historically it had been like a three-year debt market, hmm. but now they're going out to seven years. That was a, pri to do a, one. Pri a private deal? That's with an insurance company. With an insurance company. Yeah. And we're, we're, doing, we're working on one financing over there right now that we're trying to get 10-year term on. So you've got... Uh, you know, in the occupancy rates in the apartment, we have 50 apartment properties we own in uh, primarily Tokyo, and we're running, you know, 96% yeah, But rents are barely flat, right? They've started to grow a little bit. Really? They've basically been flat, but they... Are, you, are your tenants expatriates, or are they domestic? They're domestic. How do you get rid of them? How do we get rid of them? Don't you have an eviction problem in Japan? That's why they're so highly occupied. Huh? <laughs> Spoken like a lawyer. That was good. That was good. That was good. 
It took only 25 minutes for a good one. Yeah. <laughs> he lost again. I lost again. <laughs> so uh, we're not trying to get rid of him. So, uh, yeah, you don't have the kind of turnover in Japan that you have here. I know, but let's say you have somebody who doesn't pay. Sorry? What do you do with someone who doesn't pay? That doesn't pay? Yeah, how do you get rid of them? We have almost zero delinquency in Japan. So it's, it's but, not, unlike the but U.S. It, it, I'll ask the question you, a third time. No, no, but if you think about... <laughs> let's switch for a minute. If you think about what you're doing now, you're buying at a four or five yield, you're financing at one and a half, and you're getting all your return out of yield. Yeah. There's no ca uh, Rents are flat. That's correct. At okay. best. Think about now. the U.S. now. Right. Let's think about what we're doing. Let's, Let's look in a low growth environment, low inflation, low growth. We better get used to it. Well, and that's what we haven't bought an apartment building in Japan in five years. Right. We're not buying in Japan. We're financing in Japan the stuff we have. Um, and, and, you know, we, we still think that... Uh, especially as long as the, you know, Freddie and Fannie continue to finance here. We just did a 10-year a loan at 3.5% on one of our properties. So, if you But doesn't that go back to what you're saying is that, I mean, effectively, and that's where I started, which is that our, our investor base doesn't really look for, you know, looks for 10, 9, 10 yield all in. So if you're getting it from yield, yeah, if you're getting it, it, then you accomplish your goal. I think we have to re... I think in real estate itself has to re-aim its its sites, just like everybody did when interest rates are. I mean, where do you get where do you get yield? Where does an investor get yield? But, so the but, don't, I don't but, but if you look at it, institutional returns, institutions have brought the return criteria down, and they're going to bring seven them down to eight again. percent unleveraged. Most of it comes from yield. Mm -hmm. They're not That's looking right. for any capital That's appreciation, right. and it's a lot so. safer. Wait, than wait, wait, seven to eight percent IRR. 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 Not, total return. Not to total return. Total return. Except far but less most of it's current. coming out of yield. But you look, that's why our right. asset class is so easy today, relatively speaking. I mean, you, right. we can produce these. High, well, our first billion four of capital, equity capital in the new fund is earning better than a 12 current. It's ridiculous. On office, retail, industrial. We don't have any industrial. Office, retail, apartments. It's kind of a, it's a wacko. It, and the reason is that the, this exists. Boy. Oh, they really like our panel. That's it. That's it. We're That's done. It. We're done. They want to invest. What is that? <laughs> the yeah. uh, the reason is because is because uh, we can lever so much line. more yeah. than um, than the than the publics can. Good. We can go back to work. <laughs> Remain calm. Where the yes. panel? But Barry, don't what? What did she say? She, they're, they're investigating be, something. They're Please investigating. remain calm. Yeah. Okay, we'll be calm. There you go. That made me more nervous. <laughs> How excited <laughs> people get with us as the panelists. That's what I want to know. I think you said wacko, and that's what started. Okay, well, um, let's shift to uh, uh, terrorism for just a minute. <laughs> um, that's not even Peter, funny. Peter, you are the, uh, you're the chairman of the uh, Homeland Security Advisory Council. Um, we've had some difficulties uh, throughout America uh, recently, uh, Boston in particular. What, are, what have you seen changing in terms of the way that security is being uh, applied to real, real estate assets, particularly ones like yours, which are retail that have a real community uh, bonding experience where lots of people go into open spaces or closed spaces? Yeah. Well, basically, the, the, the way I got into this is we bought the retail lease at the World Trade Center six weeks before 9-11. So I got a whole uh, education in management, insurance, terrorism insurance, and, and security. Um, the biggest issue is in our business is that prior to 2001, the largest operating cost we had was cleaning cost. Since then, the highest operating cost we have is security. It takes up 25% of the operating cost of a uh, regional wall asset. Wow. 25%. 25% of operating wow. cost. And the problem that you have, and we've been trying to do this, I've been trying to drag the industry with me for years, but they won't come, is that you have no idea whether you spend it correctly or incorrectly. Mm. You have no idea of the threat. Now, I might be a bit old here, but you could put a Sherman tank outside your mall and it does nothing. So we've spent um, large amounts of capital on security systems, on camera systems, on uh, face recognition cameras. And, and I think if you look at Boston, the most fascinating thing is that, that 
the authorities got the view of the bombers from a Lord and Taylor camera outside the entry to Lord and Taylor. Is that right? It wasn't from official cameras. Yeah. It wasn't New York City. It's not the, on the other side. If you're in London, um, you cannot walk anywhere near our mall or anywhere in the street without being followed with uh, face recognition. See a lot you of guys spend as much money in the UK as you do here. Uh, yeah, like, we do. We do. We integrate with the UK. That, that the problem you have in America, which is, which is actually a structural problem, is the way the country works. Because the way the country works is first you work, the city has jurisdiction, then the county has jurisdiction, then the state has jurisdiction, and then the feds. When you work in the UK, you work with the feds and the local guys straight away. There's no tiering of, 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 uh, of um, responsibility or organisational control. Um, so we are working on those levels everywhere. Uh, we have uh, major technology as you come in and out. But as you've seen from the mall business, um, when you look at things that happened in Oklahoma and, and uh, Nebraska and other places, that you can have uh, uh, terrorists come in with an AK-47 and just shoot away at the mall. I mean, we live in a free society. The, the, the best thing that we do and where we spend most of our dollars and we run a very sophisticated system is in response time. How quickly can you work with the local authorities? How quickly can you get response time? How quickly can you give them information? And, uh, and uh, the way we operate is that everyone, we, we run drills every year with the local authorities. Um, all of them have uh, access to our cameras. All of them have access to the mall and, and, and all of the uh, information systems we have so they can pinpoint the issue. And, and the reason we got to that, and the reason I'm at the Homeland Security uh, Advisory Council, and this is the last point on this, is that we digitise all the plans to all our malls, and we've been doing it since early 2000. So we get in, we digitise the plans, we take digital photographs of all the entries, exits, fire hydrants, all these silly little things. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, you will have uh, hedges grow over fire hydrants, so the fire department gets there, they don't know where they are, stuff like that. And we actually had the plans of the World Trade Centre digitised in our systems after it went down. It took us 10 days to find somebody who would want to accept a copy of the plans of the building. And we had two levels below grade, grade, and two levels above grade, all planned out, all entries, all exits, everything else. And so we, we, we operate those systems to do that. Um, I think the last thing is, from an equity point of view, and we all have this, is before 2001, the, ter the risk of terrorism on all of our assets was borne by the global insurance markets. Even with TRIA, the risk of that has moved from the global insurance markets to the equity owners. And clearly, a major political issue coming up for the real estate industry in the next 12 months is the expiration of TRIA. Yeah. And, uh, and whether or not it'll get renewed. I mean, the answer is, um, it has to get renewed in some fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, but or, just like there was a lot of resistance last time, uh, I suspect there'll be a lot of resistance again. The, the, the biggest argument for it, though, I mean, similar to FERPTA, since we're talking now, I might as well get it out here because I've been working it really hard, it, is that when you allocate capital globally, you look at the risks to that capital. And when you look at the US, there are two or three things here that the rest of the Western world doesn't have. You have the issues with TRIA, whereas if you invest in England, you have the pool re system. When you invest in Australia, you have it. You have it in Canada, you have it in France, you have it in Italy. If we don't have something like TRIA here, the risk investing in the US on terrorism is higher from an insurance point of just, view, just tell everybody everybody point what view than anywhere else. Tell everybody what TRIA is. Sorry? Tell everybody what TRIA is. Some people probably don't know. Uh, the Terrorism Insurance Act. What, what happens is, in, in most countries, the federal government sits behind the insurance industry for a catastrophic loss. In the UK, it's uh, 50 billion pounds. In Australia, I think it's 50 billion dollars. Here, the US government has created a system uh, of losses above 50 billion dollars, where the US government actually is the reinsurer to the global insurance industry. But it's the same thing for the uh, foreign investors in real estate in the US with the tax regime that's here. Because of the way the tax system works, there is an extra cost in investing in the US when you exit assets. And so when you look at allocating capital globally, you have to get a higher return out of the US than you do out of the UK or out of Australia. And, and when you look at these things and we go to Washington to deal with them, part of the thing that's missing is that global, uh, 
global uh, uh, attraction of capital. I think and Sam, how do you I, Sam and I would tell you there's a lot missing in Washington. <laughs> Sorry? There's a lot missing in Washington no, besides, true, besides just their global conference. That's not even on the top of the list. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me ask you uh, one other question, Peter. If you can bring up slide 16, please. Um, you'll see that online retail sales, um, slide uh, 16. I'll be waiting for this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I lost the bet. Usually that's the first question I get asked. <laughs> um, this isn't the first time that we've heard that the physical stores are obsolete. Um, you had the catalog. <laughs> Give me a break. Uh, I mean, we, we've heard in the past, you've heard catalogs. Uh, years ago, we're going to take care of it. And then we had home shopping network, television. And, uh, and now we've got the internet. And you've got a large portion of sales that are coming there. And, and I know that you are uh, you're coming in and, and dealing with procurement centers and different deliveries and industrials competing. Um, more importantly, I, I understand that you are trying to merge technology with the retail experience. And uh, there are apps that uh, I, I read about. Uh, there's apps where women can uh, go on and then find in stores where Mo uh, Michelle Obama dresses. Which right, right, and right. then also the men can find uh, Hillary Clinton clothing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but it, it, if. Uh, it, that was good, that was, yeah. you're getting better. Yeah, I'm sorry. So um, can you uh, talk a little bit sure. about how you're doing that? Sure. Look, look, let's get the base right first, okay? There's a lot of noise about the internet, and they get great press. But, but we had, a, we had a, uh, a session in uh, San Francisco about 12 months ago about internet sales with the internet guys themselves. And to a man or to a woman, everyone who came and presented from the offline world showed me a chart where 10% of the sales in the US are online and 90% are offline. Every offline retailer wants to tap into online. So, so, firstly, the mall industry isn't dead. I'm still here. You know, we're still doing well. How, how are you here. negotiating leases now as a result? Are you sharing an online sales no, yet, the not. way that you were sharing growth? We're not yet. I, I, look, I think the issue is this. Where the world is moving to, and, and you'll get this from the technology ones, technology sessions as well, is everything's moving to mobile. So people are not sitting at home anymore, except a few people in my house, um, looking on guilt every time they can. Um, they're not sitting at home surfing the web shopping. 70% of our customers are actually going online to research a product and then coming to the mall and buying it. The key for us is how can we create a digital platform so that when our customer searches for the product online, they can then link into the center, not just into the center, but into the retailer, not just into the retail, but into the retailer's product, to, to, to their yeah. stock, to their SKUs. And how do we create a service for our customer that gives them a better experience in the mall through digital technology and connects them to the retailer? If you step back and have a look at what our business actually is, what we do is we aggregate retailers into a piece of real estate that makes it easy for the customer to come to, shop, and leave. If we can do that digitally as well as physically, we will then be giving the customer a service. Yeah. Can I, I, I'll just add one thing. I'm on the, I just joined, I guess they went public in December, the Border Restoration Hardware. And I, I went, two reasons I joined the board. One, um, I was curious about their sourcing because they, they're producing amazing goods at very cheap prices on, in China. Uh, but the more interesting question was the balance between online catalog and physical. And they're rapidly closing mall stores and opening 60,000 square foot showrooms actually, which will become mini anchors at malls. They're going to go from a 6,000 square foot spot to a 60,000 square foot spot in the mall. And the, their sales are about a third, a third, a third. A third in store, a third in catalog, and a third online. And what they're finding is that they need this physical presence. I mean, and they're not al alone. They're like many retailers. So I actually, it's very interesting to see the evolution of the space. It's not people. There are certain categories that are just people. I mean, the mall's really for teenage girls. I mean, they go in and they shop and they try on 45 dresses and it's a five-hour thing and they go to six stores. You can't really do that online. It, it's you not know, but books or. are dead. Look, books I, are done with the mall. I, That's over. I'll, I'll tell you the problem with the debate. It's not an either-or debate. Right. It's actually right. when you, when, just not just restoration hardware. When you look at most of the retailers globally, most of the top brands, 
they are closing marginal stores and they are building yep. much bigger ones. I, the, the, the perfect uh, example was I was sitting with uh, Philip Green in London at a conference and uh, they built a 25,000 foot store at Stratford that's doing amazing sales. But they closed six stores in the area. And he covers the rest of the consumers through his website if they don't go to the <coughs> stores. What you're getting is a concentration in the better assets, a concentration of retailers. But the internet and uh, the, the technology and the physical world are starting to merge everywhere. What is your same store sales growth in the US uh, in the last 12 months? Six and a half percent. Right, it's fantastic. It's, it's also three great. times inflation, four it's, times inflation. It's almost identical to the phenomenon that happened in the late in mid 90s. The number in Brazil is 10. Wow. 10 percent same store sales. Same store it, sales. it was 20. Actually, was 20, it yeah, was 20. Yeah. I was there for that too. <laughs> yeah, we got there we for got the 10. 20. We missed the 20, but that's okay. We'll but this right. this phenomenon is exactly what you saw in banking. Everybody said retail bank branches were going to close. They're going to be out of business. Though nobody will use a branch. It's it's a both business. It's definitely not an either or. Because people still, most people still will not make a deposit in an ATM with cash or with a check. They just refuse to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's why they charge for you to take a withdrawal, because you can't charge them to make a deposit because you wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. well, so, with, with, with three and a half minutes, to, I'm going to take Barry on. I'm going to make a prediction here that bookstores come back to the mall. I'm, if they're still in business. I'm telling you, as book bookstores? As a bookstore. As a bookstore. What are they going to say? Barnes and oh, let me ask, let's do a Coffee. survey. How many people in this Coffee. room would like to go to a bookstore and buy a book? <laughs> What? Have a look at that, guys. I'm telling you. Look at the Book age of this crowd. Bookstore's yeah. going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you. The, Ask the, me how many Janine, my wife's in the audience. Janine, house. we noticed this on last weekend or so. We, we, were all, we went away. And the majority of people were reading hardcover books. The world goes and comes back. Where were you? In Australia? Back. No. <laughs> we're not that backwards. What do you want? Um, but I'll tell you, I'll make a prediction, because you know, we're going to redo Century City. We've we re redone ourselves at Culver City. We, we will have, not in every mall, you won't have them the same way you had them before. We will have bookstores again. Let me, let me, just, uh, let me just interrupt here, because uh, we only have a couple of minutes, and we always do this, which is uh, to look at um, some advice for the audience. Um, as we look into the future, there's a lot of things that concern us. We've talked about them. Uh, the impact of natural disasters, terrorism, Honey Boo Boo's mother, finding out Al Michaels is your designated driver, <laughs> and uh, waking up to Gary Busey's face, which would be very tough to do. That's Wrath of God stuff. So um, in one minute, um, I'll start with you, Bill. What do you, uh, where, where do you see the greatest opportunity over the next 12 months in the, well, in the globe? For us, it, uh, it's in really uh, two markets. It's the Western United States. We, love, we still like the apartment business. Uh, and it's uh, the secondary, but Peter made the right point at the beginning, there's two markets in the UK. We've been investing for higher yield in the, more the secondary markets. Uh, and uh, we still think Ireland uh, presents great opportunities this year. Okay. Nick? Um, I'm going back to your horse analogy. There's different kinds of uh, courses for every horse. And I think for our investors, uh, basically the safer asset classes. So domestic, US, uh, Canada, uh, we, we look at the we'll look at the England market. We'll look at the the, the Netherlands and Germany. But um, we're staying into the more boring asset classes like retail, net lease, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, grocery anchor shopping. We're staying with the staples. And I think um, I think our biggest advice right now is to keep your yield expectation relatively low because I think we are in for a flat ride for a while. And uh, so if you're looking for an eight or a nine or a ten and you hit an eleven or twelve, it's a good day. I'd stay away from the opportunistic stuff. Sam. I think Mexico. I think Mexico is at a cross point. Uh, I think the greatest thing that ever happened to Mexico was Fukushima uh, that, in effect, disturbed the supply chain. And I think every manufacturer in the world who's dependent on Asia is never going to be as dependent as they were before that tsunami. And the impact on Mexico, particularly the middle of the country, not the border, the middle of the country, is the single biggest beneficiary of the, quote, hedge on Asia. And I think that over the next five years, uh, it's going to be tough to outperform Mexico. Barry. 
Uh, it's a micro market. It's not a macro market. It's, it's opportunities. It's cities who bought office buildings in places like Charlotte. We just bought Wells Fargo's headquarters there for $240 a foot. It's a double-digit cash yield, and it at least doesn't expire until 2022. So, I mean, and I think Europe's going to be a big portion of what we do. For the, I think our, our investment in Europe will go triple, more than triple. We've tripled our overhead, so it better triple. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're, we're done. We're in the housing market, too. We, we do, uh, we took a home builder public. Uh, that's going to be an interesting market for, it's going it, to, you know, real estate moves in waves. It doesn't move on a dime. And the housing market, it's probably not as strong as it looks because of all the investors in it, but it's, it's, it's on the way north. It's just going to be an interesting place. If you and start it has in Antarctica huge... that's, and you go north, you're on the way north. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's going to be a... Uh, it's going to help the U.S. consumer against the tides of sequestration yeah. and the negatives. We were with we're, the Bernanke. But we're, we're going to be out of time, yeah. so okay, I'm going to move on here. Um, but thank you. Anyway, Peter, uh, uh, since I got told the session's over, we run this global company, but the best place is going to be Century City. All right. <laughs> well, uh, please join me in a round of applause for Peter, Bill, Nick, Barry, Sam. And we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.